This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome, or welcome back, to self-work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas for 30 years. I started self-work about five and a half years ago to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in psychological or emotional issues, or you've had trauma that you're trying to deal with, and you recognize it, and you're an avid podcast listener but also to those of you who may have just been diagnosed, and so you're searching the internet for podcasts that might give you some answers, and perhaps you can find them here. But I also wanted to reach out to a third group of you who may be looking for answers, but you can't see yourself going to a therapist or some kind of mental health clinician in order to get that help. But I'm hoping that you're just curious, or sadly, you're just unhappy enough to listen to self-work, see what you think, And maybe it will warm you up to the idea of opening yourself up to this kind of experience in person. Self-work isn't therapy, but hopefully I've been a therapist long enough to where you can listen to me and get some idea of what you might be able to expect. It's a privilege to have any and all of you here. Where did you learn who Josh Peck was? Through his award-winning performance in Drake and Josh when he was just a teenager? or starring next to Ben Kingsley in The Wackness, or has it been more recently in Disney Plus's Turner and Hooch? In fact, his name was familiar to me, but when I looked up Drake and Josh on YouTube, I thought, oh, oh yeah, I know who he is. (laughs) What I learned in this interview is that all of us likely didn't know who Josh was, because for years he strenuously devoted himself to developing the Josh he wanted you to see, the comic, the really funny guy. Only through fighting severe drug addiction and finding sobriety did he begin to realize what he hadn't wanted anyone, including himself, to see. And he began to do very hard work. He was abandoned by his dad. He grew up in a very loving but somewhat vagabond partnership with his mom. And he decided on the cusp of adolescence that he was going to be successful. And he was. But the pain he'd been hiding from was waiting for him, as it always is. Celebrity overdoses that ended in death, Heath Ledger and Brad Renfro, woke him up to what he was doing. Another very important part of that journey was finding what he calls his apostles, a piece of advice he got from Sir Ben Kingsley himself. I thought that part of the story was so helpful. Maybe you have apostles that you need to identify, or you need to look for your own. I loved talking with Josh. His book is funny, yes, and I wondered at the first, is this just going to be a funny book? But his sincerity and very mature humility shine through. His journey is more than worth sharing, and his book, Happy People Are Annoying, is available now. So in this episode, sponsored by BetterHelp, you can get to know the real Josh Peck, as he is now, and who he intends to be in the future. But first, let's listen to a new message from BetterHelp about the offer they have for self-work listeners. I'm proud to say that BetterHelp has been a sponsor of self-work for more than two years now. They're ranked often as number one when compared with other professional therapeutic online services and do their best to match you with a therapist that you'll feel gets you, is attuned to you, and with whom you can find the kind of help and healing you need. You can do video sessions, you can text, because BetterHelp wants to offer you the most accessible and private therapy they can. Their therapists are licensed professionals. In fact, I've received offers from BetterHelp to become one of their therapists, but self-work keeps me busy. So if you need services that are financially affordable and convenient, then trying BetterHelp may be the best choice you've ever made for yourself. And you get 10% off your first month of services if you use this link, betterhelp.com slash selfwork. You know, I'm a therapist because I got good therapy, because I learned the immense value of hearing another experienced and knowledgeable perspective on my own life from someone that cared and was invested in my getting better. So try BetterHelp and get one month at a 10% discount, betterhelp.com slash selfwork. 
So now, here's Josh Peck. Josh, thank you so much for joining Self Work listeners today. I'm more than pleased and honored to have you on. You're kind of a different kind of guest for me, um, so I'm I'm really happy to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm so happy to be here, and I love a psychologist. Uh, I've been seeing one for 15 years, so I feel I feel comfortable. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, I uh, often tell people that I'm a therapist because I got really good therapy. I got some bad therapy, but I got mostly good therapy. So I was actually a professional vocalist in my 20s and made the took me nine years to finish closing at the Fairmont Hotel in Dallas to seeing my first patient as a psychologist. So it's been an interesting life. Do you find I, I find in the psychologists that, that I've met um, and therapists that there's a good portion who knew it right away. Mm -hmm. And then similar to your story, there are people who found it in sort of like the second act or the next chapter of life. They were drawn to it. Why do you think that is? That's an interesting question. I can only answer for me. I, you know, singing was my dream and I was, I wanted to sing. I wanted to be a musician, professional musician. And that was my passion. And what I learned, and actually Ashley Stahl has written a book about, about this called U-Turn. And she says, many times your passion is not what you should do for a living. What you should do for a living is, should be the, just should reflect your natural traits, the things that come to to you effortlessly Mm. and i think that you know although i loved music i just really wanted to what came to me much more easily was curiosity in people i wasn't really a an extrovert so you know me up on stage trying to entertain i'd love to sing but i didn't really like to entertain i was good on at theater but not on stage you know as an entertainer so anyway that's my story that's a great, I, I love that quote you mentioned, because it makes a lot of sense, this idea of like doing, I think Scott Galloway, who's a marketing professor at NYU, talks about, you know, what is your superpower? Like, what is intrinsically something that you are great at that you could, in turn, make a living doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think you quote him in the book, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Well, okay. So enough of uh, my own history. <laughs> Thanks sure. for asking me questions. You know, I was talking to someone yesterday about interviewing you today, and she said, well, in two sentences, how would you describe the book? And thought I, I thought, I'm going to ask him that. In two sentences, how would you describe the book? Wow. I guess I would call it um, a self-help book hiding as a memoir. And then the second line would be views from the halfway point oh i love that yeah because you're not 77 you know you're in your 30s right yeah yeah right oh i like that views from the midpoint well my first thing that i wrote down i said early unrecognized trauma because you say in the book you don't miss what you don't have and you were talking about your dad who left what do you think about that now having grown from when you first said that, that your dad not being a part of your life was something you didn't miss because you didn't have it. What do you think about that now? Because I hear that a lot from people. I think it's a really good assessment. I I think I figured that if it was hard enough navigating life with friends who had dads feeling left out, feeling so painfully different, that that was the way that I was paying for not having a dad. So in theory, I, it wasn't about mourning the lack of the relationship, mm-hmm. but more about dealing with sort of the crap and the difficulty that came with just him being absent. And I know it might sound like the same thing, but it really wasn't. It wasn't about the man. And, and I say this in the book a few times. It was more about me being frustrated with my lot in life that it just seemed that at every turn I was having a much different experience than my friends. And to your point, I didn't realize until he passed away and I really started to mourn this man that I never knew that I I did have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The second thing I said was it kind of mimics yours. It's a story of a young man who created himself to be someone that met other people's expectations to someone who didn't need a facade and would fit his own expectations. 
I think that's right. I mean, and I wonder how much that just pl- played into the desire in which to feel maybe not bulletproof or Teflon, but just to be okay. Mm -hmm. Because maybe it was ingrained in me from really early on that if this guy left, 50% of my parental system left, what's wrong with me? Sure. And probably it was this deep seated desire to be a value and to, to prove him wrong for leaving. Right. Right. In fact, I think when you were on the cusp of being a teenager, I believe, and I don't have this quote written down, but you said something like, the child, the veil of childhood dropped. And I decided I didn't want to feel this way anymore. And boy, did you go about the business of steadily, steadfastly, consistently becoming a student of what you wanted to do. I have a quote here. I was used to walking into situations at a disadvantage, real or imagined, and I became a student. That's when you were on the Amanda show and you were, they had cast you, but you sat out for several episodes. And I was so struck by the determination that you had. Yes. I, I, you know, I grew up as an overweight kid and then extremely overweight in my teen years. So that's what instilled in me that line of, I imagined people made a snap judgment about someone extremely overweight. They probably did. (laughs) Yeah. And it was either, you know, there was some animus attached or it was just people, especially in the nineties who were not emotionally evolved, who wanted to help, but were so stunted. They didn't even know how to articulate it. So they would do it in a way that was very insensitive. And so, um, I think I started to accrue these these skills as, a, you know, these assets born out of a defense mechanism. And then, too, as I said, yeah, I, I get cast in the show and I'm 13 years old, but I'm not, you know, I, I'm not at the level everyone else was. But instead of resenting, you know, the fact that they weren't utilizing me, I tried to become a student of all these people who are so much better than me. But I I guess, you know, so many people would say, well, yeah, I'm here, but then they're not using me. And and instead of that serving as an impetus to study harder or try harder, they would have been defeated by that. And and you instead turned it into fodder for more and more and more determination. And even at 35, where I feel like I've done a a huge amount of growth and evolution, it's like even there are it's a 50 50 scenario in which. Half the time, I feel like I walk into things and I feel extremely just sort of confident and uh, reassured by my ability. And then there's times where I go, oh, yeah, like this is this is the way I go about things. I'm coming in at a disadvantage. This isn't working right yet. The only difference is at 35, I can recognize it and I don't let it take me into a neurotic spiral. Totally. I mean, you know, we're, we're all a work in progress, <laughs> yes, but we. I don't become ultra reactive and start making it worse. I sort of accept like, ah, you know, that old familiar feeling. And uh, and I, I sometimes I can't believe still at 35 that I'm like, ah, this is the way I felt at 13. It's just a little bit more matured. One of the things that because you were talking about being really, really overweight. And of course, that was a part of you being on the Drake and Josh show was that that was part a lot of the I watched a couple of episodes and the the funny lines were all about that. How did you handle that? That that place that was so vulnerable for you. And yet it became part of this script that that was going to be part of the funniness of it. I think to the writer's credit of Drake and Josh and what made it good and have sort of this lasting power was, you know, the creator of the show was, you know, um, pretty overweight himself and and had also been a a kid actor. And so I think he was so familiar with sort of the tropes and for lack of a better word, the hacky humor that can come from the low hanging fruit of making fun of someone's appearance that he was, they were always sure to be really smart about Drake and my relationship. So, you know, Drake was handsome and cool and a musician, but he was also kind of dumb yep. and sort of the straight man. Whereas my character was nerdy and overweight, but he was incredibly smart and really funny. So 
luckily there was a good balance. But to your point, I just think what was so hard was this idea of you walk out on stage in front of an audience of 400, you know, teenagers. And no matter how funny you are, you're not getting the same sort of applause as kind of the teen heartthrob next to you. And I, I think that hurts. Yeah, I bet it did. I bet it did. So what was the trigger that I don't quite remember from the book? What was the trigger that actually you said, I'm, I'm going to lose this weight? I talk about it in the book, but not in, in, in a lot of detail. I remember I was 17 and my mother and I, we would take cross country trips all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom's terrible. an interesting person. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's terrified of flying. I remember thinking throughout my life, like, of course we don't take planes. That would just be too normal for the packs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're driving and I was just bloviating, you know, espousing some vitriol about my, you know, certain men in my life and how disappointing they were and how it rooted back to my father. And I, I remember my mom looked at me and said, you're angry. She was your first apostle, you said. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she just cut right through it and kind of said, you know, I am your mother and I'll always love you. But if you show this side of yourself to people in your life, they're, they're not going to stick around. It's not an attractive quality and you need to let go of this anger. And while I wasn't equipped to really deal with it in that moment, just being exposed in that way, like literally just lifting the bandage slightly so that some air could get in, suddenly there was just a shift. And I remember that summer being in New York and being 300 pounds, I just, I made a shift. I started walking more. I'd walk the streets of the city, sort of eating a little healthier, not like some 180 difference, but being more mindful. And it was like between that realization in the car and also having wanted to start losing weight for a decade, right? I was finally ready to do it. You know, I mentioned the apostle, and that was one of my favorite things that I loved about the book. Can you explain Ben Kingsley? you were in a movie with him and, and you asked him a question and he answered it. I'd love to hear that story. Sure. Um, so I worked with, you know, Sir Ben Kingsley, who's my favorite actor. Because I'm a- ben King- Sir Ben Kingsley, I should. <laughs> Listen, no worries. But I, you know, I know he's, he, he is very, um, you know, fond of his knighthood. And I, so <laughs> I work with this, this guy who's literally my Michael Jordan. Um, and, we're shooting for six weeks in New York City. And on the final day, I was probably still collecting father figures, but I felt compelled to ask him, you know, at 20 years old, if he had any advice. And he looked at me and said, find your apostles. Now, it was in this moment, I thought, you know, I'm looking for the secrets of how to be a movie star, not some New Testament <laughs> deep cut. <laughs> and... He said, uh, he said, surround yourself with people who make you better, who you can celebrate with and also help you through challenging times. And if you find yourself in a room with people who don't make you feel that way, leave immediately. And you also right then said, and sometimes those apostles are the people that will risk telling you something that you don't want to hear. Totally. And, and I would say a theme of apostles are them telling you something you couldn't have come to on your own because you would have come to it. And, and they have to be willing to hurt your feelings in an effort to do what's best for you. Right. I circled that. I, I think that's a wonderful uh, way of going back and marking your life to see when, when did these experiences happen? Was it a person? Was it a group? Was it that I learned something that I could not have learned on my own? And only because I opened up to that kind of connection was I able to, to really hear that. And, and certainly, like you say, it has to come along at the right time of your life that you're actually ready to hear it. Absolutely. It was. um, And and in that moment, I mean, it would take years for it to really set in for me. But once it did, once I was actually ready to employ that into my life, it it was such a turning point. Hmm. That's that's fascinating, I think. So I wrote down to when when I was reading the chapters about, you know, you're becoming an alcoholic and, and a drug addict. I put down addiction hopping. 
Did you realize at the time that that's what you were doing or it was just totally like mm -mm, didn't realize that? And if you've been in therapy for 15 years, you would have been in therapy by then, right? Yeah, I actually might have misspoke. It, it, it's probably closer to 20 at this point. And, and God bless my therapist who, you know, I've always been so fond of. But I remember this time specifically and that while there were a lot of people in my life taking a hard line with me, mm -hmm. he just, I mean, granted, you know, at least his time wasn't totally wasted because, uh, you know, he was getting paid to be there. But he, <laughs> he gently sort of helped guide me towards 12 step, um, which I know, you know, not all psychologists subscribe to, but many will sometimes say to a, and you can probably speak to this better than I can, knowing in recovery, there are certain psychologists who will have a patient who's obviously an alcoholic or addicted and say, we can't even do the work necessary until you, you get into some sort of recovery program. Mm -hmm. And, and that makes a lot of sense to me, but he never took a hard line. He just really gently guided me towards that and kept, you know, delivering evidence and data that would suggest that my life was unmanageable. And, yeah, I, you know, as far back as I can remember, I ate um, sweets different than my fellows. And I was using sort of my first introduction into something that gave me a nice wave of dopamine and helped to numb my feelings. And then eventually when I lost the weight, I was a new body, but with the same head. Yeah. And so when I found drugs and alcohol, they were so much more efficacious with less calories. So it was sort of a match made in heaven or hell. And, and yeah, and, and what I did with it to say, okay, so you had been so resolute, so determined, so focused on proving your dad wrong or proving, you know, proving you could be successful. You say, I was dying to be reckless. Mm. And I thought, you know, I see a lot of people do that who grow up in either really highly rigid control environments. They do this and then they are supposed to do that and then they're supposed to do this, whether it's set by themselves as individuals or whether it's parental expectations. And I hear the same thing from them. They reach a, at some point where they want to do something that's not controlled, that's not about the plan, you know? Yes. Oh, I think that's. You know, and that is sort of like the X factor in all of this, because I certainly had a proclivity for addiction. And I, you know, as you said, I was sort of hopping. But then the X factor was I just wanted to be young and stupid. And I felt like I was owed this time. And and it's funny, I, I told this during another podcast and someone said, don't maybe you were kind of owed that, that time. And, you know, it's. It's not unreasonable. I think a lot of people are sowing their wild oats in, at that part of their life, but I was just doing it in such a hyper uh, destructive way yeah. that it was not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was a very dark part of your life to, to read and to, to, I'm glad you lived through it actually. Totally. And it was, I mean, having my mom who's now 77, read the book and you know i lived it so it's it's not um it, it's not new information for me but a lot of it was for her even though she intimately knew sort of what i was going through and was having her heart broken watching her kid go through this she she had never actually heard some of the details and and she kind of called me halfway through the book and said i need to put it down for a bit and revisit it because it's I, I imagine it's very challenging for a parent to hear their kid go through that so that leads us very naturally to you're now a parent. <laughs> yeah. And how old is Max? He's three. He's three. Oh, wow. What an age. <laughs> do you have kiddos too? I do. I was lucky enough to have a child. I'm, I'm, I guess your mother was an older mom, and so was I. I was 39 when I had a son, so he's 27, and he's there in L.A. So. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I also, I'm, I don't know if he'll ever write a book, but there are probably some that I, I would find difficult to read as well. <laughs> Naturally. I mean, and that was, I remember my mom sort of, yeah, having, you know, obviously supportive and a fan of everything I do, but, you know, reconciling this idea of uh, your child is a reflection of you. And 
despite the fact that we so clearly know that I was able, knock wood, to come out on the other side and have this beautiful full life, by me being so public with my story, I sort of inadvertently was public with her story. Outed her a little bit too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Was she okay with that? I think it took a minute. But I, because to her credit, she's a pre, pretty private person. And I think she's always had like a, a natural talent for for singing and, and, and acting. And she's a natural performer, but she didn't quite go for it. I, I think she didn't have the support. But also, I, I think deep down, this life wasn't for her. I mean, I think her greatest joy is, is getting to watch her kid, you know, be successful and in, in something that she's always loved. But to your point, she's she's a pretty comfortably private person. Mm-hmm. So your wife is named Paige, and yeah. um, you also call her one of your disciples, or you one of your apostles. Yeah, and I, I would imagine, and I hope that most people would would call their spouse uh, or or their partner an apostle, um, because you know it sort of encapsulates what a partner is in, in most cases with someone who sees you for who you are who is able to cut through sort of the subterfuge or the projected sort of image that you want to show to the world. And they, you know, they have a vested interest in you being at your best because if you're not, they suffer for it. So my wife uh, in a loving way has never held her tongue. If she finds something that's that I could be doing better. My husband, when my book came out a couple of years ago, it was like a couple of days after. And it, at that time, it was doing pretty well. And he got up one morning and goes, Margaret, you got to come look. And I said, why? He goes, there's paparazzi out in the yard. And of course, it wasn't. <laughs> that is awesome. I said, well, I, I cannot say on air what I said to him. <laughs> Good for you. He sounds like a great guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, he uh, he definitely lets me know when I've gotten a little bit big for my britches, as we'd say here in Arkansas. <laughs> well, talk about a little bit about your experience with AA, because I believe that that's another. Uh, there was a woman that uh, you heard speak at AA, and she said, what are you willing to let go of that stands between you and happiness? And that was an apostolic kind of moment for you. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've found a lot of, uh, it's, I, I, my whole life has been changed because of 12 step and it really works for me. Um, there are other ways to get sober, but this just happens to be a way that, that worked for me and, and also for friends of mine. And, uh, you know, in my experience, it's just, there's, you know, an old saying, like, there are no new ancient truths. The genius of the 12 steps is its packaging. For me, that it can appeal to a guy like me and really break through. But, you know, like many things that involve some sort of higher power and, and it it can, you know, it can be secular. It doesn't have to be, you know, it, it's a higher power of your own understanding, which doesn't have to be faith based. But I always say the thing I learned in 12 step is the same thing you learn if you were in a church or a synagogue, a mosque, a, from a great self-help book or from a great, you know, therapist, which we're just like these tenets of living, these ways in which to abide by the social contract that allow you to have, you know, the byproduct is a good life. And that's, you know, restraint of pen and tongue and gratitude, acceptance, surrender. If you want self-esteem, do esteemable acts. Yes. And now okay. this paralysis, you know, help your fellows boat to the other side and yours too will cross like, <laughs> you know, you, there's plenty of slogans, but um, the most annoying part is they're they're all pretty true. So, yeah. yeah, there's a reason why there are a lot of people who are non-alcoholics that cite the serenity prayer, because it's just it's just a bit, like you say, it's universal. Yeah. And, and a lot of the I talk about this woman that I heard speak at a meeting and I actually changed one word that she said, which was, what are you willing to let go of that stands between you and sobriety? Right. But, oh, OK. OK. But I felt like, especially in a book about, in quotes, happiness and for people who aren't in 12 step or don't have an issue with with addiction, but just have a, a, an issue with life. It felt like happy was actually uh, uh, an appropriate substitution. Sure. Um, and but basically what she went on to say was, you know, early on when we're working on ourselves, it's easy to let go of the glaring defects like 
anger and resentment, you know, jealousy. We all want to get rid of that. But she's like, what about the deeper things, like the things that you think define you, like that job that you think you can't live without or that relationship that you think defines you? Like, are you willing to let go of that in the interest of happiness? And it doesn't mean that that you should go burn your whole life down. It just means that sometimes life reveals itself in ways that we could never have expected. And I remember thinking when I was listening to her, wow, she is so right. And then I thought, God, I hope that doesn't happen to me. (laughs) And that's exactly what happened when I went almost three years without working as an actor. Mm -hmm. And I had to reconcile how much my identity was wrapped up in this thing that I thought was my raison d'etre, was my, you know, reason for living. Mm -hmm. But then all of that happened concurrently, it sounded like, with this acting coach named Sharon that you began working with that... I really had to smile when I read that, you know, you would say one sentence and she would have you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it because um, I've been there. And at the same time that you were going, I think going through those three years, you were also recreating your sense of, I'm not going to put on that, that act, that facade, that persona anymore, that I don't want to do that, that I need to find my own way of, of being, my own way of expression, my own way of quote unquote acting. And, you know, I'm no expert on acting, but I, I, I watched some of your early work and then I watched some of your later work and the, the difference was astounding in, in your believability. Now, I know the first time you were a kid and this was you were an adult, but I was just going, well, you could see exactly the work that he did. It was, it was astounding. Well, I I really appreciate it. And I, yeah, I mean, as a kid, I was sort of going off like a little bit of raw talent and also just, you know, my mom telling me to milk the joke, (laughs) the the bigger, the better. And, and it certainly worked for, you know, a very broad slapstick kids television, but it didn't really work anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went through those three years of professional insecurity, what I, what I knew was this, was that if one day I had to let go of this thing I'd been working on since I was 10, I needed to know in my veins and my bones that I had done everything in my power so that if I did eventually have to walk away, that there was no stone unturned. And, and a part of that was going back to acting class and looking at these bad habits I'd accrued and really just sort of my lack of technique. And when I was referred to Sharon, it was sort of told to me, like, Sharon is as, as close to what the original method acting was taught in the actor's studio in its heyday when greats like Pacino and Paul Newman and Sidney Poitier were there. So this is really like no holds barred. You're going to get a real education here. So, you know, I completely leaned in. And while Sharon you know, did, didn't hold back. I no, knew, <laughs> oh my gosh. I, the first day I came back from class, I was like breathless. Like I couldn't, I, because it felt like my entire facade had been shattered in an instant. Um, but I was willing to do that. And I, I think a lot of people never quite give 100% of themselves to the thing they're going after so that they're, heart has um, an out and they can always say, well, it didn't work out, but had I really given it my everything, then it worked. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I I had to give it my everything and the result was luckily really good, but it wasn't without, you know, months of just feeling utterly lost. I want to hold up your book here because this will be on YouTube as well. Happy people are annoying. I love the picture. <laughs> and oh. so it is on the back is really funny too. Winner, best author of this book, mom. <laughs> <laughs> You're a really funny guy. Before we stop, I, I would love to talk about um, when you found out your father had died mm. and what that changed in you and, and how you began to think of it differently. Totally. I... So I guess I'll talk to you about the years sort of leading up to when he passed away, which I was about 26. You know, at that time, I had been sober three or four years. I had lost over 100 pounds. 
my career was really up and down, but the data would suggest that like on some level things are going to work out. And I had felt like I'd sort of become a man despite him. And I was resentful because he was also in his 80s by this point. Yes. So I felt like, well, if I go find him now, I know what he's getting. Like kind of a full grown adult son who really needs nothing from him. But what do I get? Like, we're not going to play catch. I don't even get the full experience now. It's, it's too late. And, and then randomly one day, my mom and I were getting lunch and I sort of told her as I did every couple months that I was perhaps toying with the idea of going to see him. And she went home and Googled his name after just curious and his obituary came up and she called and, and told me. And, and I remember, you know, throughout much of my life, it always felt good because I knew he had another family. And I knew just through some Googling that he, what state or like what town he lived in. And, and it felt good to sort of have this like emotional grenade, you know, that I could unleash I on could his If life. I wanted to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was like powerful. And when he died, I was like, oh, like he really he brought me into this world on his terms and he left on his terms. So I. I basically started to mourn this guy that I never met. I say in the book without all the requisite deli trays that come with a good Jewish funeral. And, uh, and, you know, basically to sum it up, I wound up going on Facebook, finding my older siblings and finding a treasure trove of pictures of my dad, which I'd never seen what he looked like. And I'm seeing him at bar mitzvahs and at weddings. And then these beautiful tributes to this guy when he passed and I realized that he was the dad for them that I wanted him to be for me. But you never let them know that you knew, right? I never did. But I also knew that I couldn't be the arbiter of the ultimate right. Like what he did was not right to me. But that wasn't the only part of this man. Right. And it helped me to start to let go. And it's very significant that that was not another reason to keep you angry that he had gone out the way he wanted to go and all that kind of stuff that you said, I started to mourn. And that's a wholly different choice. Holy W H O L Y, maybe H O L Y. But it's, it's a wholly different choice than to say, so this is another reason why I'm going to carry around this chip on my shoulder or whatever, that my dad never was there for me under any circumstances. So I hope you're giving yourself credit for that. Maybe it was just time and you were ready, but that's really good. Ah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So you've got some exciting things on your plate now. Maybe you should tell folks because I'm sure they're interested. Oh, sure. Um, I've got a, a movie for Netflix coming out called 13 Musical coming out on August 12th. And uh, my my uh, podcast, Male Models, that uh, I, I love doing and, and a couple other things in the works. But those are kind of the things in the next couple months. And what is Male Models all about? It's really just a hangout podcast with me and my good friend, Joe Volpes. And we talk about sort of pop culture and current events. And uh, it's 30 minutes of, of comedy once a week. Oh, OK. Just having fun. It's great. Yeah. Having fun. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So one more question. Sure. How do you think writing the book actually affected you or changed you in any way? I would say we all have our own shorthand um, that exists in our mind. And because we we're so intimately familiar with the details of our lives that it can be easy to sort of gloss over the nuance. And when you write things and you put things to paper, I think it can reveal certain things that you are not completely aware of. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a line in the book that I was like the one you said it earlier, like, being 14 or I'm sorry, being 12 years old and being broke with my mom and that the veil of adolescence had fall, uh, had fallen. Like, I don't think I'd ever articulated it that way, but when I look at it, I go, Oh yeah, that's exactly how I felt. Or I talk about when I met my wife and because of the work that I had done in recovery and with my shrink and because of my mom and apostles in my life, I say, I became someone worth loving And then I follow that with, now, you might say that everyone is worth loving, and that may be true, 
but not everyone is capable of attracting the kind of love they desire. And again, I, I had never articulated it that way, but it's true because my wife comes from a really healthy, secure place. And had she met me earlier in the book around chapter seven and eight, she probably <laughs> would have gone running to the hills. <laughs> And what are you learning about being a dad? You said you come by it very easily is what you said. Oh, I'm so lucky. Yeah. I, you know, to me, being a parent's the only thing that's not overhyped in life. It actually lives up to the hype. Yeah, it and, does, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, it's the best. And Except for that moment when they first come into the world and you look at this child and you go, oh my gosh, what have I done? He, he has so much power over me. <laughs> Just, you know by moving or smiling or closing his eyes or whatever. And then there's this immediate sense of incredible gratitude and, and what an honor and what a privilege. So I'm glad you got to experience that as well. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for being here at self work. We really, really appreciate it. And I, I can't wait to see what else is going to come and I will be following you and, and enjoying not only, you know, now that it's not like, what you said about being a child star that people think they know you because they've watched you grow up. I don't feel like that. I still feel, you know, obviously there's a lot of you I don't get, but it will be such fun to, to know this little bit about you and then see how else you grow. Oh, I so appreciate it. And I love chatting with you and I, I can tell you're very good at what you do. I'm like, I'm like, uh, let me see if she needs any new patients. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've got a pretty good therapist of your own. <laughs> I like them. Well, thank you so very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you once again for being here at Self Work. Some of you have written to me lately that you're a three-year listener. I even have a four-year listener. I'm so pleased about that. But it infers that the team and I are keeping things fresh enough for you to want to come back week after week. Please, if you can, leave us a review on the Apple Podcast or wherever you listen especially a written one. That gives me lots of clues as to what you'd like to hear, what you want more of, what you want less of. But ratings are fantastic as well, because that's what people look at when they look at the podcast. Please feel free to email me. I try to make myself very available to all of you. And if I don't respond to you, which I get so many, I can't really, but I will try to either devote a podcast to it, or certainly a lot of them have a lot to do with one another. So I will mold those into a podcast episode and hopefully answer your questions that way. My website's drmargaretrutherford.com. My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. And you can go to my website and subscribe. All you'll get is a weekly newsletter giving you the blog post and the podcast, maybe a little bit of news about me or what's up with my work. But that's it. And it's a very, very easy way to stay in touch with what's going on here at Self Work. As always, I want to thank you for being here. Please, please take very good care of yourself, of those you love, and of your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.